Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this panel. Um, these are these are dark days to some extent around the world. You know, all all around the world, countries are in a, a medically induced economic coma because of a, a tragic worldwide epidemic that is killing killing you know many thousands of people. And it is hard not to be focused on just that. But here we have an opportunity to have a conversation about what happens after it, and question lies before us of you know, what kind of what kind of a recovery are we going to have? Many people think that a good guide to a, a good recovery is a caring, thinking about building a caring economy. Now, the economist um, Rihanna Eisler wrote some interesting stuff about this over the years, and she defines a caring economy as to value and make visible, caring for the environment and to value and make visible the work of care and to invest in the development of early childhood education, our most important asset, and we have a Minister of the Crown here who cares a whole lot about that, and to pursue transparency and metrics in the caring economy, changing our measures of economic health, which leads you to ideas like the Social Wealth Index. So we're gonna talk with a fabulous panel today to see what they think about that definition and what a caring economy is all about and then how we can get to it. And our so my colleagues joining me today are Evan Sears, she's a member of the European Parliament. She's been a member since 2019. She's currently serving on the Committee on Civil Liberties and Home Affairs, Committee on Development, the Committee on Foreign Affairs. In 2020, Sears was awarded the annual Best Newcomer Award uh, by Parliament Magazine. She was the rapporteur of the European Parliament opinion on the EU strategy on women's rights and gender equality and recently contributed to the conference toward a society of well-being. Uh, Katrina Chen was elected as the MLA for Burnaby Lougheed in May 2017. Hooray! And she was sworn in as the Minister of State for Child, Child Care in July 2017. Prior to her election as an MLA, uh, Katrina served as a trustee on the Burnaby Board of Education. She's worked as a community organizer with ACORN, has been an executive member of several uh, local nonprofit organizations. As a mother of a young son, she understands quality, affordable child care, gives children a strong foundation for the future keeps the province's economy and communities moving. And my colleague on the board of the Broadbent Institute, David Villan, is a city councillor in Montreal uh, in the riding of Jeanne Mans in the fabulous neighborhood of the Plateau. In Montreal, she was elected under the banner of uh, Projet Montréal, and she's on the team of Mayor Valérie Plante, who was also, by the way, a member of the board of the Broadbent Institute. Uh, who have been running the city most stably since November 2017. Mavis sits on the Committee of Economic Development and Housing, as well as Environment and Parks. She's been a journalist for Radio Canada International, specializing in international news and the integration of newcomers to Montreal. And it is wonderful to be with you all today. Thank you for taking part in the panel. So let's get right into our discussion. And um, I'm going to propose we just proceed with roundtables, but of course, uh, uh, jump in if you want to, and we'll begin by asking you what th you think you thought of that definition that I just offered. What's your definition of a of a caring economy, and what does it look like in your jurisdiction? So why don't we start with you, Evan? What do you think? First of all, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, very important um, discussion uh, or conversation. Uh, as you said, uh, I think it's uh, the uh, the issue is more important than it might have um, been for a long time. And I totally agree, of course, with the definition, but I think that there are quite some uh, different aspects that we need to uh, take into account and comp uh, a combination of components. A welfare state uh, or a caring economy for me is um, a welfare state that offers free uh, and quality health care, education, child care, elderly care, including affordable housing and decent work, and a social security net so that you are not left in the hands of destiny um, if you um, are put in, a, uh, put in a challenging situation. And this pandemic really showed the importance of uh, all of this. Um, all of this but i also want to highlight the importance uh, of an inclusive system that doesn't leave anyone behind in the sense of also having a feminist approach an anti-racist approach and anti-discrimination uh, uh, and having anti-discrimination laws in place it is for me a society that prov provides opportunities not only for some part of the society but the whole part of the society 
as I sometimes see um, the society as a, an ec ecosystem, and in an ecosystem, or an ecosystem is dependent on the well-being of all organisms. The well-being of the society is, in that sense, dependent of the well-being of the whole population. Uh, that would be my uh, definition of, uh, of a society of well-being. Very good. Thank you very much. How about you, Meva? What is how do you define a caring economy in Montreal, and what does it look like in Montreal? Yes, so uh, municipal uh, times in times of pandemic is a lot about uh, action. So uh, I will speak uh, with you uh, about action. And uh, for me, the caring economy uh, during the pandemic is putting people first in any decision you take. So what does that mean? So it means starting with the basic needs of the most vulnerable people. It means providing shelter, food, and toilets to the homeless, to the people in very precarious situation. I must say, we are, I am very proud to say that in Montreal, we converted a whole hotel in 380 rooms for the homeless. And that's only one of the examples of many uh, shelters we have been building in the last months. It means also uh, the importance of public infrastructures. For example, our parks have been more important than ever. There are a lot of there aren't so many places where you feel safe at the moment when you can meet with your friends and your family and parks have been so important uh, in providing us relief in the last uh, months so we need to take care of our parks in order to take care of our people and we need in the next years to invest more in new parks uh, libraries for example have been so important for us uh, lately. Uh, Montreal has worked very hard uh, with the provincial government in order to reopen the libraries. We need places for the young people to connect to internet in order to study. We need uh, places for newcomers to connect to internet in order to speak with their families, uh, for people just to, to have a place uh, to be sometimes. Our community organizations also are really important. I must say that we are very proud in our neighborhood. We uh, managed to create uh, a special emergency fund with the credit union system to help and support our uh, community organizations. Public transportation, of course, has been uh, one of the main, um, has been more important than ever uh, during the pandemic in order to uh, help uh, essential workers go from their job to their home. So uh, we've continued uh, to run our metro and buses and to offer, even at the beginning of the pandemic, free transportation. We've done a lot to support local and small businesses and uh, our cinemas and independent theatres. Thank you so much. So finally, over to you, uh, Katrina Chen. Um, what is, how do you define the caring economy and what does it look like in British Columbia? Thank you so much, Brian. Um, to me, I believe a caring economy is about lifting everybody up. It's looking after everyone in our community. And before we do that, and when we're investing in programs and services as a government, especially, that we need to recognize the inequities that exist in our community. That, you know, for example, people always say that this pandemic is like a storm, but we need to recognize that a lot of us are on different boat. Um, being impacted by the pandemic differently. And also some people may not have a boat at all. We have to lift them up and making sure that we're saving their lives. And how those inequities are impacting people differently are important for us to remember when we're investing in social programs, policies, and government services. And as uh, an immigrant, as a woman of color and a single mother, I, I, feel that, I feel that and I see those inequities all the time uh, through myself, my personal experience, and also through people that I work with and families in my community. And how do we make sure that our policies will work for people and lift them up based on their conditions are so crucial. And that is the caring economy that we have to focus on. And I think one thing that I really uh, also have noticed uh, throughout this pandemic is that how, for example, people are looking at workers and different workforce with a different lens and new perspectives now that the grocery store workers the food services workers and people who have been on the front lines doing very important work but their work used to be very undervalued before are now 
our local heroes. And I am very encouraged to see, for example, there's a pharmacy right beside my office. Every time I go in, I hear so many customers thanking the workers who are working there to make sure that we can get the basic needs that we have, um, the services that we count on. And I think this is a great time to really think about uh, our workforce, uh, people who work in our communities. And for example, for the work I do, I work very closely with a lot of early childhood educators. And that's another workforce that before um, people don't, you know, they're underpaid and people don't value their work as much. But uh, through this pandemic, we've seen how childcare is so critical for parents to be able to return to work, to support our economic recovery and how essential that service is. And I think it's important to look at all the workforce, all the workers, making sure that they get the supports they need. So when we invest in our economy, that we have a new perspective and to, to be able to invest in the long-term um, economic recovery that will create a caring and a just economy for our local community that can benefit generations to come. Thank you. Well, that's kind of the heart of the matter, isn't it? And it's not just a storm that we're confronting. We're confronting a, a first class historical economic shock that we're not done with. And then the question will lie before us, which is how do we recover from this? And we know what our friends on the other side are going to argue. Uh, they're waiting for their moment to restate austerity arguments and to argue once again in the Reagan Thatcher mold, you know, the government is the problem. Um, and what we've got to do is, uh, you know, Un remove the shackles um, and let uh, uh, let things return to normal. That's going to be their argument. So here we're, we're, we're engaged in a coming practical economic argument about what is smart to do to recover from this shock. And I many of many people on the left would argue that you know the construction of a caring economy is essentially our alternative. So if that's the case, is that your view? And it's is there an economic case to make for going down this road as well as an as well as an ethics case? Is this basically smart public policy? Is it is it good fiscal policy as well as being good principal policy? What do you think, Evan? Well, I think our friends on the other political side are wrong. Uh, I think if anything, the pandemics has shown that we need a caring economy that is uh, in the center of a society of well-being that puts, uh, as uh, my other co-panelists have said, puts people's need um, first. And in that sense, um, I think we need, I mean, we, we need a society or a, a caring economy, or for me, the caring economy in that sense would mean that people are put in labor, people and labor means, uh, or have the possibility to, to, uh, to uh, access labor. Labor means uh, better growth. Better growth means uh, the possibility to, for example, eradicate in poverty and fighting inequality. So everything is uh, linked to each other. Um, so, uh, uh, and if, if something the pandemics has shown that we need to have healthcare system, for example, in place um, in order to provide people uh, good and quality healthcare when they are in need. And this pandemic have, have very much shown that it doesn't see any class background, it doesn't see any color, it doesn't see where you are from or where you live. Uh, in that sense also, it shows the importance of having a true fully fledged welfare state that provide those things that I and my colleagues have previously or my co panelists have previously mentioned with healthcare, uh, education, uh, a, fu a fully functioning uh, labor market and a uh, fully functioning social uh, network to rely on when the crisis uh, hits both us collectively but also uh, individually. So I would say that our colleagues on the other side of the political uh, spectra is wrong. And if something, the pandemic has shown that we need a, 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 a caring economy that puts equality in the center. Do you agree with that, Meva? Yes, uh, very much. And um, I will speak about what happened uh, in uh, Quebec, in the province of Quebec at the beginning of the pandemic, because uh, it is such an example of what happens when caring economy is not at the center uh, of our politics. Uh, our shock has been very, very high uh, within the, the way we look after the elder people. 
during the three first months of the pandemic, Quebec has had the highest rate of COVID infection per capita in Canada, and the gap was very high between Quebec and the other provinces. Why? Because of decades of underinvestment in the health system, and in particular in the system for the older. The workers of public and private retirement homes, uh, retirement homes were, were already very much overworked and lacked basic support. So when the pandemic arrived, the situation just became catastrophic. And I must say that today uh, we still haven't measured how much uh, the first wave of the pandemic has hit the families, has hit the workers, and it will take time to recover from everything that has happened in the, in the retirement homes. But in the meantime, our universal, the universal child care uh, system that um, my colleague Katrina is uh, speaking about, uh, and we know that in Quebec, we have a very uh, strong and very interesting universal child care support, uh, a public system of places at only $8.25 a day, and it has shown how efficient it is during this pandemic. It has been supporting essential workers, workers during the big lockdown we had in the three first months. And it shows how important it is. So what is uh, the economic argument around those two examples? Is you need a strong system to take care of your kids and to take care of your parents in order to go to work, to contribute to society. We've all lived with it. Katrina, you said you're, you're a single mom with your kid. I have two kids. How can you believe that I can be uh, contribute to society if I have a, a two-year-old kid at home? How do you feel uh, when you work for a minimum wage and you hardly pay for childcare? So I think, uh, yes, I, I think it is absolutely critical um, to economic recovery that we invest much more in uh, caring in our caring system. What do you make of it, Katrina? Yeah, I totally echo what Mevat has just said. And uh, I think a caring economy is so critical to our economic recovery. And we've learned so much from this pandemic. And when you're investing in people, it is always good for our economy, um, just like the work uh, I've been doing on childcare. And we've seen that from public education, uh, public health care and investing essential services such as housing and public transportation as well. It always has long term economic returns. And on child care, for example, the Conference Board of Canada has said and has um, uh, shown a result of every dollar you invest in, in child care and early learning, it gets six dollar economic return. And those are long term investments that can benefit our whole community as a whole, not just our economy, but the well-being of our children and our families. It's also a gender equity issue when you think about how historically women has been the ones who are looking after our children. And for example, in BC, the early childhood education workforce, 97 percent of the workforce are women. So those are things that we really need to think about. And again, back to what we've talked about, the inequities that exist in our community and how invest in social policies like a universal childcare system, like what we've seen in Quebec, could create a more equitable society for us to live in. So um, in BC, for example, um, we started the work to build an inclusive universal early learning and care system in 2017. And we know we're kind of late to the game, especially compared to Quebec, but it's really sad that BC is probably uh, still one of the first jurisdiction and province after uh, Quebec to start this journey to build inclusive uh, universal early learning and child care system. And we've rolled out over three dozens of initiatives um, in short three years. Um, we've really tried our best to bring down the cost of child care to accelerate the creation of spaces and also to support the workforce as we know how those um, issues are essential and that connects one another in order to build an inclusive universal child care system. And we've learned a lot from Quebec's experience as well. And, and we also actually did a pilot site, um, a program. It's called Portotype Site to cap child care fees at $10 a day. We provide block funding. And at the same time, we have been using those pilot sites to look at the result of economic return. 
And in just about two years of our pilot site, we already see an economic return of every dollar we invest in has $2.5 return right away. And that's significant. So when you invest in social policies and, and programs like childcare, uh, it does create economic return. You may not see it uh, based on dollars, but it does create those economic return um, in our community as a whole. So let's just stay on this topic for a minute longer because we, um, we're, this is the Broadbent Institute. And when we do panels like this, we're hoping to equip people who watch them with tools to send them off and be activists. Um, and this is the heart of the debate when we, uh, when we pr make these proposals um, and debate them in the public sphere. What our opponents say is, yes, these are all lovely ideas, but how can you afford them? Now, look, what I'm tempted to say in answer to the question, how can you afford them from the right is, are you happy with the three to four trillion dollars that the current epidemic has cost in good part because we weren't resilient enough? What if some of that money had been spent beforehand to build more better long term care and better health care? Do you think maybe we could avoid it pay, spending it in a panic? And how can we afford not to when you look at the costs of not doing so in the future? But that's my argument. All three of you are practical politicians. You you have these debates in public at the doorstep. How do you answer the question? How can you afford it? Why? Where are the economics of this? Wouldn't, aren't these nice things, but we can't afford them. They're not practical measures. We need to focus on paving highways and cutting taxes for rich people. That's the important stuff. What do you think, Evan? Well, I think you're totally right, uh, Brian, and I totally agree with you on the description that you had. Um, but I think... I mean, instead of like the liberals and the right always does a cut for the riches, uh, cut taxes for the riches uh, and uh, and on the um, expense of uh, the many of the people, uh, we would like to do opposite um, to take the whole population into account, not only one part of the population. And I also believe very much that everybody uh, uh, gains on that the whole population uh, is uh, is uh, being uh, raised up and not only part of it we all gain on it even those um, who uh, who already are financially um, strong so uh, so instead of cutting taxes for those who have already has we should put the money on uh, on a true fully fledged welfare state that provides all people, uh, regardless of class background, uh, ethnicity, uh, and so on, um, uh, the um, the uh, uh, the possibility uh, to uh, to live a decent life and not be scared of that one day we might get sick. Um, and I think I think that idea of a welfare state that provide everybody uh, the uh, those uh, basic needs because I think it's basic. Healthcare is basic. Education is basic. Basic elderly for me basic and the same of course with the child care and housing and so on and so forth um so that would be my my main um argument that uh, we do afford uh, it's not about if we do or not it's about where we take and where we uh, we give so where we put we take and where we uh, put into and uh, i mean in a liberal and conservative world we take from the poor and give to the rich but in our world, uh, everybody gains on uh, equality. What do you think of that, Meva? Yes, Katrina, I'm so happy when uh, I hear you speak about uh, the universal childcare system that's been uh, built, uh, that's being built in uh, British Columbia. It's uh, it's great, and uh, thank you for reminding us the figures. But uh, it has uh, been proved in Quebec, obviously, that each dollar invested in uh, childcare is uh, we receive uh, uh, is a good investment because more women contribute to society, and that creates um, wealth in the whole of our of our community. Um, I must say, as I was saying, the shock in Quebec uh, about the situation with the older has been uh, very strong. So uh, I think the people are now much more awake and much more. Um, aware of the importance of investing in the healthcare system and in the care system for the older people. And uh, I believe also that um, 
with everything uh, with the fact that you need to change jobs and to adapt to uh, a new economy uh, uh, because of pandemics uh, education also is much more uh, valued than it used to be and uh, in in our towns we've seen also uh, much more homeless people so uh, people have realized the importance of investing in um, in affordable housing that is so important for for a town like montreal and also in social services in order to help uh, the most uh, vulnerable people in our society so i think that in our in our town of montreal people have have seen uh, decades of lack of public investment so um i do hope that uh, yes that that um something is happening around the concept of a caring economy. How about you, Katrina? Do we win the economic argument at the end of the day? Totally, we can totally uh, do that. Uh, I always respond to this question and I get this question all the time at the doorsteps um, about that budget is about choices. It's the choices that we make. We can make a short-sighted choice of doing a tax cut one time, but that doesn't really have a long-term um, economic return or result. Or we can choose to invest in social programs that can benefit our community in the very long term. And I, I really agree with what my colleagues and panelists have said here. Um, you know, when our neighbors are doing well, we do well as a whole in a community. But when our neighbors are falling through the cracks and not getting the support at the public education, the healthcare system, the childcare services, the infrastructures that they need to count on to make sure that everybody um, can have the support they need when they need. Um, that would actually create a, a lot of impact um, and more economic um, needs for our community down the hall. When people are falling through the crack, um, the impact on them, whether it's social, emotional, economic impact on them, um, does not help with our economy. You need to lift people up. You need to make sure they can um, make a decent living. They have a good job they can count on. They have the services they can count on. And those are more long-term and, and and better investments in our community than just a one-time tax cut. That may sound good, but again, not a long-term benefit. And I, I really agree with what was said about how we need to focus on everyone, not just a few people on top or a selected group of people. We need to make sure everyone in our community is supported. No. I, I like landing on this one when debating the right by saying, look, what I like to Jane Carville's online line, the, on this one, we're right, and you're wrong. We've tried your way, um, and we see what the results are. Um, so um, let me ask you a question as someone who tries to be a, a good ally, um, since we uh, this panel is composed of, uh, of three in, in all your different ways, formidable uh, female leaders. Um, is a caring economy inherently feminist? Uh, how does it impact economic empowerment? What do you think, Evan? Well, it is absolutely. Um, um, it is, once again, a matter of not leaving anyone behind. Uh, you cannot uh, discriminate or keep uh, half of the population uh, outside of, um, uh, of the economy uh, and putting them aside and think that the society will automatically lead to a, um, a well-being society, a society that fl flourish. Um, so I think it's very much important to have a feministic approach uh, and uh, that it lays in the center of a caring economy. But I also want to highlight another perspective which I think is very much important and it's to have an intersectional approach also to the economy. Um, uh, that we know that different um, groups in the society are hit uh, differently uh, by, for example, crisis uh, as uh, such uh, as the pandemic. Um, we know that if uh, if you um, if you are a female and you are um, a female of color or have an immigrant background, that you will hit a bit. Everybody are hit, but then you will be hit even harder uh, by it. So it is important to have a feministic approach and it is important to have an intersectional approach to it. And that's also one of the reasons of why I, in the beginning I highlighted the importance, of course, to have a welfare state um, and that the caring uh, economy for me um, in, it means a fully functioning uh, welfare state, but it also needs to have other um, laws in place, for example, anti-discrimination laws that prevents 
people being discriminated at um, uh, in the society. Uh, I know uh, in Sweden, for example, we have uh, both people of mig migrant background, but also national minorities that feel uh, discriminated at in the society and are not able to fully uh, participate uh, in the economy, for example, just because there is both systematic and institutionalized uh, racism and discrimination taking place. Very interesting stuff. What do you think, Neva? Is, uh, is a caring economy inherently feminist? Yes, of course, and I, I don't want to repeat uh, what Ewin uh, has been saying. So uh, as a feminist, I believe that any investment, even in infrastructure, should be feminist and should take uh, into account uh, racialized minorities. So uh, what does that mean in a town? It means when you invest, for example, in a library, is it in a sector with racialized people? Or is uh, is everybody has everybody got the same access to a library or community center when you build a new sport facility who are you who are, who are you building it for are you building it for men for women are you building it for racialized minorities or you build uh, how, what sport are you deciding uh, it should be for uh, when you build a new park when you decide to invest millions in order to have a new park where do you put the park in which neighborhood do you put the park is it accessible to everybody? Leisure, it's been very interesting. We've had <clears throat> um, analysis about uh, who has time for leisure? Where, what kind of leisure should we offer to people? Streets, parks, do, uh, who feels, safe in, who, who feels uh, safe in the streets? How can we make them um, nice for everybody? So uh, for me, to, in today's world, uh, carrying economy or investing in infrastructure, we should uh, take into account in priority uh, minorities and uh, women. What do you think, Katrina? I totally agree with uh, our colleagues have said here and how also we look at how this pandemic has highlighted so much inequalities that already exist in our community, including gender equality and how women has been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic, especially when the pandemic was first hit. So many mothers mm -hmm. had to put their career and their work or their studies on pulse to be able to look after their childcare needs. And, and especially women of color, uh, immigrant women that we've, I totally agree with what has been said about the intersectional lens that is so important when we're looking at issues like this. And sometimes I think about in politics, um, you know, this election, we, we had an election last year and, and we were reelected back in BC as the governing party. Um, this is, the, I think, one of the first or probably the first uh, time that we have a government caucus that has a majority of women. And I'm so proud of that being this caucus that we have more women than men for the first time. But this is 2021. We've been talking about gender equality for so many decades. And this is such a long struggle, but in 2021, we're still one of the first. We're probably, I think, the first in Canada to have more women than men in the government caucus. You know, I'm proud of that. Uh, and we have a gender ba balanced uh, cabinet uh, as well, but I think it's long overdue. We need to make sure our political elected representatives reflect the population of our community and the diversity of our community. And one thing I have to say, I'm really proud of what our government has been doing is that every policy and every um, legislation that we're bringing forward always have to have a gender-based analysis. I, th I think that's so critical. And I think that also echoes what um, the other panelists have said is to make sure we always apply that gender equity lens and also the intersectional lens that we have to to always apply when we implement policy. Okay, well, I think we have time to talk one more about one more aspect of this. And I, um, I, I think the way to get into it is this. Um, last time there was a global economic shock in 2008, governments thought a big part of the solution was going to be a big infrastructure throw. And the discussion was, we need shovel-ready projects that are going to start right away. Um, they're going to put people to work right away to deal with the economic issue. And the result was some some really, really nice roads all across Canada um, that you can drive around on as much as you want. Although, as Neva knows well, uh, some, of, some of the jobs are still to be done. Um, now, there's been quite an interesting discussion in the United States uh, following the Biden infrastructure throw, because that's not the frame that 
that we see in that through it all. What he's saying is that investing in uh, the environment, investing in long-term care, investing in health care, that that's an infrastructure program. And of course, what he's been getting back from his opponents is that's not infrastructure. This isn't appropriate to have in here. But what he's talking about is some of the key building blocks of building a caring economy. And so how do you feel we should carry that debate? Um, sort of quickly, we have to, we're, we're heading toward the end of our time, but do you think that is building an economy, an infrastructure program, and remembering that this is probably the biggest public investment throw that we're going to see in this generation, is that a debate that we have to win? What do you think, Evan? I think for sure that it is a debate that we have to win. And uh, I, um, I mean, if we don't want to repeat um, our mistakes, then we really also need to make sure to learn from them and also to after we have uh, together got out of this pandemic, put those uh, things in place, um, political uh, need, uh, things that we really have seen that we are in need, in, need of in place. Um, I think one one perspective that we maybe have not mentioned uh, enough is uh, the sustainable approach, uh, the environment that you uh, just mentioned, Brian, uh, because if we don't do that, it would mean that we would be seeing more of those crises that we are seeing today. But we also need to be prepared um, for crises in the future also, prevent them, of course, but if, if we would be there, then uh, we need to have um, systems in place that uh, that is not uh, surprised uh, as we were uh, by this pandemic. And uh, if something I think also we have also during this pandemic um, understood or um, understood that um, we need to, of course, and have a, uh, a caring economy on a local, regional and national level, but as well also have uh, in international and global um, strong institutions in place. WHO has shown to be uh, important tool in fighting this pandemic, but we also need. I, I would see. I would like to see a strong uh, WHO for us to not be in, in to not be surprised as we were uh, by this pandemic. Thank you. Neva is investing in a caring economy infrastructure. This is a debate that we need to win. I would love it, but at the municipal level, uh, we are everything is uh, decided by from the province, and uh, unfortunately, we are, would not be able to uh, consider a uh, caring economy as uh, infrastructure. Uh, but what it shows is that uh, towns uh, have been on the front line to fight against this pandemic, and uh, we uh, must find another way to finance towns because uh, it's very difficult at the moment uh, in Quebec to, for, for, for us to find the means uh, necessary uh, when we have big um, uh, challenges as uh, the pandemic. And what I would like to speak also about, uh, about infrastructures and the caring economy on the municipal level is, as Katrina uh, was saying, uh, we have seen so much of inequalities uh, in the light of this uh, pandemic and the inequalities have been very strong on the access of public space uh, in, in big towns. Space is limited in, in towns and also inequalities are very strong. So we need to think about the way we share public space. For example, uh, giving back um, uh, streets to people. Uh, this summer in Montreal, we will have more than 10 commercial arteries entirely pedestrian. That means supporting local businesses. That means more safe space for disabled, for kids, for the elder. That means a nicer quality of air when you go and have a walk and go to your local uh, business. We've been developing cycling, cycling paths uh, for years, and now we are seeing more and more kids on the cycling paths. All the people, now the cycling paths have been connected to um, neighborhoods outside of the like center gentrified typical neighborhoods where cycling paths. So um, about infrastructure, carrying economy, I believe very much at the municipal level, we, we, must, we, are, we are changing the set of mind of uh, who does the public uh, space belongs to. Uh, people are seeing it differently, but we have a lot of work uh, to do to think about how to have a share of uh, public space. Fascinating stuff. So is making cities 
livable and accessible and everything that Meva was just talking about and is electrifying the economy and is building more senior care and is building more child care and is improving health care, um, is building a caring economy infrastructure, Katrina? Is it an, a case that we should make? Is it a case that we should make nationally, provincially and municipally? Totally. And I feel like I'm, I'm so honored and thankful to have this opportunity to actually learn so much from this conversation and really to think about how those essential services and how those uh, public infrastructures and investments we made in those essential critical services to people are, are really uh, public infrastructures and, and, and and public good that um, we need to have in every community, whether it's on a municipal level, provincial or federal or nationally. And, and I, I really echo what said about the partnership, um, the local community, the, the municipality, school district, the provincial government and the federal government really have to connect together to be able to deliver those services and to share the expertise that each levels of government have to make it work for people. And I think here, just looking at the how we can see care work as infrastructures is so critical. And I think every politician should really think about this because sometimes when you go into politics, you think about your election cycle and that's a natural thing to think about. You think about what are the results that I can get in the, the three or four years that I, I'm in this position. But I think it's so important rather than looking at those short term uh, years, we need to look at the long term commitment, um, the dedications that we, we should um, put in when we're investing public dollars that should go into public good that can have long term impact. And instead of just looking at short term promises, and I think that's something we really all need to think about as a politician of how we work together as a community, we work with different levels of government to focus on the long term vision. And I would say um, the work I do on childcare, I've learned so much through the past uh, three and four years when BC started from scratch. There was no system at all. It's a very broken system when it comes to childcare here in BC. Um, very little coordination and even the responsibility of childcare is shared by four ministries. And, and so as a minister of state, how do I pull that together to build a new social program for, for BC has been quite a learning journey personally and also for our province as well um, to look at how that works. And of course, it costs a lot of money. Budget is always something that you have to put in the back of your head. But it's so important to think about that this should not be just a three to four year plan. It should be a long term plan of how an inclusive, universal early learning and care system can benefit young children with their early learning needs, benefit families when parents are struggling to return to the workforce and benefiting our whole economy as a whole and how the dollars you're putting in today, um, like BC has putting um, over uh, almost $2 billion uh, just on early learning and care in three years. And that's a significant dollars from the provincial government to build a new social program for the first three years. And now we're seeing the federal government coming in and say they want to build a national child care plan, which is exciting that how the partnership is going to work. We have to look at the coming seven to 10 years, not just the three to four years, because those investment and those dollars that we're putting right now is going to create significant benefits and social economic returns for our community that will benefit generations to come, not just you know, five to 10 years, it's gonna be 20, 30, 40, 50 years, especially you look at other jurisdictions like Quebec or other European and countries around the world that has a better early learning and care system. So we need to look at social programs with a long-term vision and view, not just a short-term gain. Thank you very much, Katrina. Well, that was the heart of the matter, what you were just talking about, that we need to think about the long-term and now as we think about the last minutes of our panel, um, I'll just ask you all if you have any last thoughts um, as we head toward wrapping up our discussion. Evan, any last thoughts? Um, I think uh, my last thoughts on this is that um, to conclude and to summarize what I at least think is caring economy is that it needs to be sustainable, it needs to be democratic, and it needs to be social. And it also needs to make sure that all the people, not only certain part of the society, has access to the rights that a sustainable, democratic, and social um, economy uh, and society uh, provides. So, and thank you from my side, uh, for once again, for uh, the invitation to this conversation. Thank you very much, Meba. 
Yes, I believe uh, today that uh, the care economy is the big fight of us uh, progressive. It seems very obvious to us that it's what is needed. But is it so obvious for everybody? What I've seen a lot during the pandemic is how much um, each, uh, each everyone's ideas is more profound than it used to be. For example, environmentalists are more motivated than ever uh, for profound and quick changes. Socialists are more willing than ever to fight against inequalities. But at the same time, we are seeing the far right rising in Europe. I see, for example, Marine Le Pen. She's number one in France within the 24 to 35 years old. That's scary. So more than ever, we need to work. We need to fight. We need to convince people that um, we need to take care of people. We need to invest in a caring economy. Uh, so uh, my conclusion uh, would be that our work and uh, of persuasion is as important and even more important uh, than ever. How about you, Katrina? Totally. I think we've talked a lot about a caring economy and a just economy of how we need to invest in the long-term services that people count on. And I think it's also important to remember that we're always learning as a society, as a community, as politicians, as institutions, that we're always learning together because the situation is always changing. I always tell myself that I did not get into politics to put the status quo. We're doing this work, and whether you're in politics or social services or having conversations like this, that's so meaningful. It's about learning from each other, it's about moving ahead and to find a common ground so we can make sure we're always bringing more positive changes to our communities and to our local families. And I think that's something I would like to share um, that I hope I'll continue to learn uh, from conversations like yours, from great colleagues like what we have today and uh, also be able to move ahead with our community to find the common grounds to make things better for people. Thank you so much. Well, I, uh, I'll i just wrap up by saying this. Um, this epidemic showed us is a, is a global challenge affecting jurisdictions all around the world and working our way out of its economic and social consequences is also a global challenge that will affect every jurisdiction around the world. It is the world's work for the next generation. And uh, as we often learn when we try to work as progressives, uh, you get that kind of the world's work done by working together. So thank you so much to you all for joining this panel. Thank you for watching it. And uh, this is a fight that we will all now join. Thank you so much. À la prochaine.